Church, hello there, Pastor John here. Good to be back with you again. Trust that you are keeping safe. Trust that also you're enjoying the ministry that we're bringing to you online. I'm very grateful to Pastor Graham and Pastor Rob and our elder Stuart who've also been ministering to you. Today, I want to speak to you on Cameo at the Cross. Cameo at the Cross. It's almost two weeks after Easter, but I just want to take you back there, if I may. We look at Easter in sweeping vistas, Palm Sunday, the triumph entrance into Jerusalem and the cleansing of the temple. Crowds, noise, acclamation, hosannas, palm branches, tables tipped over. And then the events of Holy Week, Jesus' arrest in the garden and his show trial. A detachment of soldiers, flaming torches, swords, denials, questions. And then Good Friday and the crucifixion, one of the most agonising deaths ever devised. Floggings, beating, humiliation, nails being hammered across, studding into a hole. And then the glorious resurrection morning, up from the grave he arose, declares the old hymn. Wonderful. And so we look at Easter in sweeping vistas. But Easter was also about people, individuals. Today, I want to look at three of them. We find them in John's Gospel and chapter 19 and verse 25. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Greatest day in history, declares the worship song. And it was, without a doubt. But the greatest day also includes some very personal, almost hidden stuff. Why? Because the gospel, the kingdom of God, the church of Jesus Christ is all about people. Like you and I. Ordinary people with an extraordinary God who puts his Holy Spirit within us and that Holy Spirit is transformational. I want you to meet the three Marys standing at the foot of the cross. His mother, his mother's sister and Mary Magdalene. Brave women. The mob had demanded his death. Whipped up by their religious leaders. The occupying forces had then crucified him. In fact, the four members of the execution squad were close by gambling over his clothes. But these three women stood close by the cross, says John. All the other men had fled, escaped into hiding. But near the cross of Jesus were these three women with John. Later on, Matthew and Mark tell us that they stood at a distance, but for now, they're near Jesus' cross. Mary, Mary and Mary. The first Mary is Mary, his mother. She'd held the eight-day-old Jesus in her arms as he was dedicated in the temple. She'd stood there as Simeon, the old man with the prophetic edge, and praised God for her son. And then she felt the shadow as old Simeon had said to her, a sword will pierce your own soul. Mary had composed her own worship song when the angel told her she was carrying her baby up in the Judean hills with cousin Elizabeth. The words had just tumbled out of her. My spirit rejoices in God my Saviour. From now on all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. But old Simeon's words had brought her down to earth with a crash. A sword will pierce your own soul. And now it had. As she stood at the cross. We certainly don't worship Mary. 
She was a woman, just like any other woman, but she was utterly remarkable. A teenage bride, a long journey on a donkey while heavily pregnant, then another long journey into Egypt to escape Herod's assassins. Then she'd lost her 12-year-old son four days in Jerusalem. And then when they found him, she didn't really understand his comments about being about my father's business. But it says his mother treasured all these things in her heart. But nothing, nothing would have prepared Mary for this day. Standing at the foot of the cross as her firstborn dies in agony. Graham Kendrick's Christmas song sums it up so brilliantly. Just a blanket on the floor of a vacant cattle stall. But there the child was born. She held him in her arms and as she laid him down to sleep, she wondered, will it always be so bitter and so sweet? And did she see there in the straw by his head a thorn? And did she smell myrrh in the air on that starry night? And did she hear angels sing not so far away till at last the sun rose blood red in the morning sky? And as she watched him through the years, her joy was mingled with her tears and she'd feel it all again, the glory and the shame. And when the miracles began, she wondered, who is this man? And where will this all end? Till against a darkening sky, the sun she loved was lifted high. And with his dying breath, she heard him say, Father, forgive. And to the criminal beside, today with me in paradise. So bitter, yet so sweet. Thorns in the Straw is the title of that wonderful song began with straw in a manger. It ended, she thought, with thorns on his head. It was said to me a long time ago, the great of the core, the great of the cost. People who make a big difference pay a big price. Mary was paying the ultimate price, watching her son die. But within this cameo at the cross, there's something very, very precious. Because from the cross, Jesus speaks to his father and then to his mother. Luke 23, 34, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. John 19, 24. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother. When John saw his mother there and the disciples whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, dear woman, here is your son. Luke 23, 4, then Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. Heavenly Father, earthly mother. Mary was part of something out of this world. She was an integral part of something eternal. She was in partnership with the Almighty. And listen, so are we, if we choose to be. If we are willing to accept that life following Jesus will sometimes be bitter, sometimes sweet. Like the other disciples, Mary was part of that first Easter but she was also there in the upper room, remember, when they received the Holy Spirit in tongues of fire. She later, so tradition tells us, moved to Ephesus with John the Apostle, and he looked after her. She was part of the excitement of the founding of the early church. The sweet had become so bitter, but then the bitter became sweet again as she received the same power that had raised her son from the dead. And she ended her days living in the fullness of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus. A remarkable woman. This first, Mary. The second woman at the cross 
was Mary, the sister of the first Mary. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary. My thought on this was, Jacob, why on earth did you call both of your daughters Mary? How confusing would that have been? Was it Mary 1 and, and Mary 2? But if you dig a little bit, the answer is much simpler than that. In many manuscripts, the Virgin Mary's name is Mariam. And this sister, Mary, was Maria. So Mariam and Maria, not Mary 1 and Mary 2. Mariam and Maria and Mary were all different versions of Miriam, who was Moses' famous sister. Do you remember? She prophesied with a tambourine. It was a favourite name for mothers to give to their daughters back then. And so this Mary or Maria was probably the Virgin Mary's oldest sister or half-sister. Now, it really gets interesting and rather complicated. I need you to follow me closely. Families are complicated things, aren't they? You know, yours, mine, these people back then. This, this, this cameo at the cross holds some very, very interesting family tensions. Mary's sister Mary, or Mariah, was married to a guy called Clopas, or Alpheus. But good old Clopas, or Alpheus, never gets mentioned, only ever as Mary's husband. That's probably because he was dead when Jesus' ministry began. Now, Joseph was also dead, for he's never mentioned after Luke's Gospel in chapter 2. So, according to the commentators, the two widowed sisters joined in the one house at Nazareth. And their combined children came to be regarded as brothers and sisters. This Mary, wife of Clopas, had four sons and three daughters. The Bible gives us the names of the four sons. James the Less, Joseph... Jude the Apostle, and Simon, plus three girls. We don't know how many children Mary had after Jesus, but this was a big household. Her sister Maria had seven. When we read in Matthew 13, verse 55, isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? All of you very sharp, attentive listeners will have just noticed that those were Mary and Clopas's kids, not Mary and Joseph's kids. As a matter of fact, nowhere else are any other names of Jesus' siblings mentioned. So it's possible, it's just possible that Jesus was an only child, living in a household with his seven cousins. The Jameson Fawcett and Brown commentary says of Matthew 13, verse 55, many of the best interpreters think it improbable that our Lord, when hanging on the cross, would have committed his mother to John if he had had full brothers of his own. This makes Mary's grief even harder to bear if Jesus was indeed her only son and maybe her only child. And it would also have made life difficult for Jesus as he grew up. His Aunt Mary's sons were certainly older than him, older cousins, and that would create tensions within the family at times. If you remember, these brother, sisters, cousins tried to take over Jesus' ministry, Mark, Mark 3.21. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. Also, John 7 verse 1, we find his brothers, or more likely these older cousins, telling him what to do. It was the time for the Feast of the Tabernacles and Jesus' brothers urged him to go to Judea for the celebration. Go where your followers can see your miracles, they scoffed. 
You can't become a public figure if you hide like this. If you can do such wonderful things, prove it to the world. For even his brothers did not believe in him. With nephews who had so misunderstood her son, Mary, in her bereavement, would have found a residence with them after his death less congenial than a residence with Jesus' closest friend, John. You see, Jesus understands difficult family circumstances. He grew up in a difficult family. And so he understands the stresses and the strains of your family life. So, on the greatest day in history, Jesus' family's dysfunctions were there at the foot of the cross, embodied, personified in Mary Clopas, his aunt. Because it's all about people. The Lord Jesus was dying for the sins of the world, but he was also dying for people, individuals. And there was his aunt Mary, Maria, standing with her younger sister Mary or Mariam in her time of greatest need. She's part of this cameo at the cross, Maria. You know, when it really mattered, she just steps up and stands alongside her sister. I think that's wonderful. There's just one more Mary. The third Mary is Mary Magdalene. John 20 verse 1 says, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. This Mary was the first eyewitness of the resurrection. Now you need to get that. That is so important. She came running to Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one Jesus loved and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So who was this Mary Magdalene? She divides opinions. Some traditions say that she's the woman from Luke chapter 7 who washes Jesus' feet with her tears and dries them with her hair, a well-known prostitute, in fact. But there's absolutely no evidence for that. Although the Jews did use Magdala to denote a woman with braided or plaited hair, and women with hair in that fashion were regarded as loose. What we do know is that she came from the town of Magdala in the land of Naphtali. Mary first appears near the beginning of the narratives about Jesus' Galilean ministry and it's there in those early days that she becomes a, a devoted follower, a supporter of the Lord Jesus. Luke 8 verse 1. Jesus travelled from one town and village to another proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household. Susanna and many others. These women were helping support them out of their own means. So she was a woman of means. She'd had an exceptional experience of the Lord healing power delivered from seven demonic spirits. And that first Easter, she became prominent because of her undaunted courage, even in the face of danger, which had broken the courage of the twelve. This Mary was the last at the cross, but also the first at the tomb, the first eyewitness of the resurrection. Now, I know we've already been back to Bethlehem and Jesus' birth with the first Mary and we've talked about the thorns and the straw but I need you to come back with me just once more, please. The first eyewitnesses of the birth of Jesus were shepherds. You know that. But shepherds at the time of Jesus were the lowest of the low. They stood on the bottom rung of the, the Palestinian social ladder. They, they shared the same unenviable status as tax collectors and dung sweepers. They were despised in everyday life. Untrustworthy were shepherds. In fact, in the Gospels, it's only Luke that mentions them. The Mishnah, Judaism's written record of the oral law, also reflects this prejudice. 
It refers to shepherds in belittling terms. One passage describes them as incompetent. Another one says that no one should ever feel obligated to rescue a shepherd who has fallen into a pit. Can you believe that? And it's all summed up in the fact that they were never admitted in court as witnesses. So who does the Almighty choose to be the first witnesses of his son's birth? Shepherds. But hold that thought. Back to Mary Magdalene. Listen to this. Let not the testimony of women be admitted on account of the levity and boldness of their sex. That's Josephus writing in the Antiquities. Any evidence which a woman gives is not valid. That's the Jewish Talmud. At the time of Jesus, women weren't even allowed to testify in court. This categorised them with Gentiles, with minors and undesirables such as gamblers, the unsane and moneylenders. But it wasn't only the rest of society who disbelieved the testimony of women. Listen to Luke 24 verse 9. When the women came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene. Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles, but they did not believe the women, because their words seemed to them like nonsense. The culture of the day considered women to be unbelievable. And Luke's gospel makes it clear the eleven disciples thought exactly the same. They thought the women were very poor witnesses. But who does the Almighty choose to be the first witnesses of his son's birth? Shepherds. And just does who? Just who does the Almighty choose to be the first witnesses of his son's resurrection? Women. Mary Magdalene being the very, very first. Because listen, listen. God always changes man's rules. He always goes against misconceptions and preconceptions and prejudice. He's always willing to begin again. In fact, he's the God who makes all things new. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Those who become Christians become new persons. They're not the same anymore. For the old life is gone, a new life has begun. So the Almighty chooses a woman who had previously been possessed by seven demons. A woman who may possibly may have had the hairstyle of a loose woman. A woman who had previously been in the background in just a, a supporting role, but is now chosen by the Lord to be his first witness to the resurrection of Jesus. Don't you just love the gospel, the kingdom of God, the family of Christ, where anyone and everyone can play life-altering roles in God's story? No one back in Magdala looking at this demon-controlled woman with all of its knock-on effects would ever have believed that one day God himself would choose her to be the first witness of the resurrection. That's the power, church, of God in action. Gives all of us such hope of what can be. Because with God, our past does not have to shape our future. Hallelujah. Three Marys. Cameo at the cross. Jesus' mother, his aunt, and his loyal helper. All with the same name, but three very, very different women. Each of us is unique. Made by God. Understood. Cared for and loved by the Almighty. He calls us to come to the cross of Jesus because that's where lives are changed forever as we embrace the bitter as well as the sweet as we become part of the family of God as we leave our past behind and become witnesses to his resurrection. I began with a, a Graham Kendrick song. Let me conclude with that beautiful one by Stuart Townend. Oh, to see the dawn of the darkest day 
Christ on the road to Calvary, tried by sinful men, torn and beaten, then nailed to a cross of wood. This, the power of the cross. Christ became sin for us, took the blame, bore the wrath. We stand forgiven at the cross. Oh, to see my name written in his wounds. For through your suffering I am free. Death is crushed to death. Life is mine to live, one through your selfless love. This, the power of the cross. Christ became sin for us, took the blame, bore the wrath. We stand forgiven at the cross. Let's just pray. And Father, we pray that as we stand at the cross of Jesus, each of us may know the power of your resurrection life that changes the past, restores us to be the men and women that you've called us to be and gives us a glorious future. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.